you. We give you all our hearts, our mind, our soul, our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Carmela. Thank you, worship team. Let's take a stand for a moment. Let's just take a minute to greet the folks around you. Just reach your hand out. Hello, my name is, tell me your first name. If you know them, tell them something about you that might surprise them, funny or serious. You thought you would greet me. So tell me something about you, funny or serious, that I don't know. Oh, man. Well. want the teaching notes and don't have them, go ahead and raise your hand up real high. Raise those hands up high. There's a hand there. I'm looking to see if we have ushers bringing them notes. Let's see, I don't see any. Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Keep those hands up high. We got some ushers in the back. Hello, Andy. I'll tell you something about Andy that everyone knows. He's an amazing man of God, very dedicated, loves people, loves Jesus, and you can count on him. So I say, you know, in the greet one another time, if you know him, say, tell me something about you that I don't know at all that would maybe surprise me that's funny or serious, either one. So that was just real. That wasn't funny, but it was serious. Okay. We have a little bookmark, okay? And it has all the apostolic prayers on the front and the back. And you can have them all. And we got a bunch of them in the back. Somebody made them and said, hey, give them to the Friday night group. So you can take a handful of them, put them in your Bible, put them in your friend's Bible, and he'll go, oh, my goodness, the Lord. Oh, I better start praying these. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, Romans chapter 15. So we have two more Friday nights, is that right? Two more, yes. So we're at session seven, we're going to get to nine. I mean, there's more prayers than we're covering in this uh, class here before the break. But we'll do nine of them by the grace of God. <clears throat> Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I, this remarkable prayer that you gave your servant Paul, that you want us to contend for this breakthrough in this city, in our family, in our own lives, our loved ones. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, paragraph A, Paul prayed that God would comfort the saints and he would unify them. And he would, as he did this, he would fill them with joy and peace and hope in the process of unifying them, because it will take people, believers, with joy, peace, and hope in order to walk in unity. Walking in unity or walking in love is synonymous, and it is the greatest and highest work of the Spirit in the human experience. You know, I've met people over the years, and they said, you know, I was in this church, and they didn't really love each other. I, you know, I said this last week, and I said, do you understand that loving in a mature way is the rarest 
and the most dramatic work of the Spirit in the human, in the human experience? And they thought, well, I just thought we were supposed to. I go, yeah, well, we all are doing it a little bit. We're trying to do it more. But to do it mature, consistent, there's nothing like it in history in terms of transforming power. And Paul's letting us know here that it will take understanding God's patience towards us and understanding how God comforts us, then giving us peace and joy. That's the equipment for a believer that's the enabling to sustain them in walking in mature love towards weak and broken people. So this teaching is filled with instruction, but it takes walking in love out of idealism. It really does require these dimensions of the Spirit in our life in order to do this in a mature way, to love people who aren't like us, people that don't agree with us, people who are maybe don't even like who we are, but we're going to love them. And that's what Paul's talking about. And he says, this is the key, the way forward. Well, I'm very grateful for this glorious prayer because these are God's ideas. Paul didn't come up with these ideas. God gave them to him. And in essence, he was saying, church, contend for this breakthrough in your life. Every dimension of it. Understand my patience towards you, and you'll have patience for them. Understand how I comfort you, and you'll have a resource to comfort them. Learn how to enjoy me. That's what it means to be filled with all joy. It doesn't mean to be giddy and you know, just exuberant all the time, although there's nothing wrong with being exuberant some of the time. But it means to the ability to enjoy the Lord, even with difficulty and delay of promises. We can enjoy him even in the difficulty of life. That we have peace, a sense of well-being, even when things around us aren't going well. And that we're anchored in hope, the absolute certainty of future victory and future glory. Those are the five components that Paul puts together in this prayer that equip us to walk in consistent love towards weak and broken people in the body of Christ. Well, let's read the prayer. Notice these five things. Paul says, verse 5, and then we'll break it down after we give a context to it. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded, to be unified towards one another according to Christ Jesus. Again, this like-minded, this walking in love, honor, the highest, the very apex of the work of the Spirit in a human's life, to do this consistently. That he would, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the Lord. Verse seven, therefore you would receive one another in the same graciousness that Christ received you. That is staggering. And you do this to the glory of God because you become trophies of the grace of God to the body of Christ that needs transformation into an unbelieving world. God's raising up trophies of grace in the midst of the church to inspire them. This thing is doable. It's within reach by the grace of God. Verse 13, now made the God of hope, you're going to need these three things, fill you with joy, the ability to enjoy Jesus in the midst of even the difficulty and the delays. He would fill you with peace, a deep sense of security when many are filled with anxiety and troubled and they can't figure out where things are going in their life. That he would fill you with joy and peace in believing his leadership and who he is and that he would anchor you, cause you to abound in hope. Faith is a present certainty. Hope is future certainty. Faith and hope are the same thing, just one is present and one is future. We have confidence about the future. That's what hope is. Hope isn't, oh, I'm wishful. You know, I really hope that happens. We could say that, meaning I wish it happens. Like, I'm not sure, and that's okay to say that, but that biblical hope is the absolute certainty of facts that are yet future that are coming your way. That's when we're anchored in hope. Hope is one of the most important works of the Spirit in the human heart. Paragraph B, 
Now, like always, we're not gonna go through all the notes here. Some of it I'm just gonna leave for you just to read, and some of it I'm saying the same thing several different ways, but making the same point, just put different language, because different people re register to truth in different ways, and so I like to lay it out a couple different ways. Paragraph B, this is important. You can understand this prayer a lot better if you know the context of it. Just like in Thessalonians, we were talking about that, 2 Thessalonians 2, you've got to understand 2 Thessalonians 1, we looked at that last week, last session, in order to understand the prayer in chapter 2. Romans chapter 15, this prayer is the end of a section of Romans 14 and 15. So he's at the end of his statements. He's at the end of his presentation. Romans 14 verse 1 to 15 verse 13 is one section. We're at the end of it with these prayers. Here's the premise that we have to understand. Then we're going to look at Romans 14 for just a, a few moments. Then that will equip us to understand Romans 15, which are where these two prayers are. Here's a premise statement. I'm still in paragraph B. There are truths and commandments in the Bible. The scripture makes them clear, and, he, and the scripture emphasizes them. There are truths and commandments, practices, that the Spirit says over and over, and he makes them really clear. But there's, they're of primary importance in the kingdom of God. We say, okay, good, got that, that's pretty easy. But there's other truths and commandments that the Spirit doesn't make explicitly clear. They're implied, and they're not repeated. They're not emphasized from Genesis to Revelation in various places. They are of secondary importance. But the problem is different believers value them and apply them differently, and there's all kinds of division that comes around those issues. And that's what Paul's talking about. In Matthew 23, verse 23, I don't have it on the notes here, Jesus talked about the weightier issues of the Word of God. He was rebuking the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verse 23, he said, You Pharisees, you tithe from all the... You know, the, all the little components that are grown in your garden, you'll tithe on them to show how zealous you are, but you disregard the weightier issues. So there are secondary and primary issues in the kingdom of God. And it's the secondary issues that are not unimportant, but they're not more important than us walking in honor and in patience towards one another. And what was happening in the early church, and it happens all through history, the secondary issues, people doubled down on them, made them the primary issue in the relationship with other believers, and tremendous divisions, and disregarding and dishonoring of one another. And that's what Paul is wanting to correct, and that's why how he offers these prayer, these two prayers in chapter 15, in that context to answer that problem. Well, let's back up to chapter 14 and just ever so briefly, because this is the sort of passage, Romans 14. By the way, there's a parallel passage, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Paul makes the same argument. So he, he gives quite a bit of material, Romans 14 and 15, Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. He gives a lot of material, I mean, of time to this issue. It's, not, it's an important issue for the body of Christ to walk in love and unity and honor with one another. He starts off, he says in Romans 14, the beginning of this section, which is 14.1 to 15, verse 13, that's one section. He goes, verse 1, I want you to receive, in other words, honors what he's talking about, a brother who's weak in faith. But don't receive him so that you can argue over uh, doubtful things. There are issues you're not clear about in the Word. Don't, don't say, okay, I'm receiving you, but I want to get you in a corner, and I want to prove how wrong you are on these secondary issues. Paul goes, I want you to receive them. I want you to honor them. Don't criticize them. Don't slander them. Don't uh, have a triumphal spirit against them. He goes, for instance, and Paul touches two main points here in chapter 14. The Jewish traditions and laws of the Old Testament 
they forbid in the Old Testament the Jews to eat certain meats. And they commanded the Old Testament laws, the law of Moses, the Jews to observe various days and holidays. So what happens is Jesus comes and he's the fulfillment of many of the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. So they're no longer commanded in the word because Jesus is the fulfillment of them. So what happens is there's more Gentile believers in the body of Christ in the first century. So in Rome, there's this Gentile believer gets radically saved, walking with the Lord for a couple years. Then there's this, he doesn't, he's never heard of Moses. He doesn't know anything about Moses and animal sacrifices and the laws and all the offerings. And they don't make any sense. He's never even heard of them. So now there's a Jewish person in town and he's super devout. He knows Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, has studied it from his youth, memorized it. He gets saved too. Now they're in the same fellowship. The Jewish believer goes to the Gentile believer and says, uh, man, I'm so established in these laws of Moses. The Gentile believer, he's real fiery for the Lord and sincere, and he knows, understands what Jesus did. And, and the Jewish believer says, hey, you got to do all these other things. The Gentile believer says, what are you talking about? No, no, that's been fulfilled in Christ. Then the elders of the church are debating, it. well, is it fulfilled or not fulfilled? And Paul's big argument was it's been fulfilled. But he says, give each other grace on this because that devout Jewish believer that grew up all of his life, before he met Christ, he was serving the law of Moses. He can't comprehend why somebody's laying it aside. And so there's this real disparity going on on these secondary issues. I mean, they're really debating them, and the leaders are, debate, are, are in division over it. Different churches in different cities are one group is applying it one way, one group applying it the other way, and within the same fellowship, they're in division. And Paul says, no, Christ has already fulfilled those things. And others said, well, no, there's the law of Moses. They're still intact. Now, mostly in Romans 14 here, it's the issue of meats that were forbidden in the Old Testament because they were considered unclean because, again, they were types and shadows picturing the Messiah. And, I mean, the Old Testament believers didn't really, I don't think they knew that. They just obeyed those. They said those are unclean meats and these are holidays and days we have to consider as more important than other days. Now, those aren't the biggest issues in the body of Christ globally among a million believers right now, but there's about 20 other issues because the human spirit's the same, where people are doubling down in argument and breaking relationship over one of those 20 other issues. It's not the ones Paul was dealing with. I mean, a little bit. Some people still struggle with those two things, but most, that's not even an issue. It's the other ones that are issues, but the principle is still the same. Well, let's go back and start. I, I gave you the context before I... I want to give you the situation before I read Romans 14 to you. He goes, receive the guy who's weak in faith. Now, understand this. When Paul calls some, somebody weak in faith, he does not mean their faith is weak in Jesus as Messiah. No, they're strong on that. He's not saying their faith is weak in believing his leadership. No, they're sure about his leadership. They love his leadership. Weak in faith in this means, in this context, means they're uninstructed about their liberty in Christ. So their conscience is troubled because they ate some meat that was forbidden in the Old Testament. And they're, oh, I'm in trouble. I don't know if I'm saved. I'm all disturbed. They're weak in their understanding of their liberty. Therefore, their conscience is disturbed. So don't read this, a misunderstanding says, well, that brother just, you know, brand new believer. He doesn't know if Jesus is real for sure. That's not what Paul's talking about. Weak in faith means they've lacked more complete instruction about their liberty in Christ, and they're living under the old regime, and their conscience is guilty if they come up short in it. They're all but trying to earn their way of, to salvation, and they just haven't connected the dots. And Paul, the Jew of Jews, I mean, Many Jewish believers in that first century, they did not like Paul because he was exposing this. He goes, we're not supposed to keep those ceremonial laws. 
We don't have to. We can if we want. We don't have to, though. Don't put those on Gentile believers. I mean, Paul had many enemies because he took a stand. So when he says, receive the believer in your church that's weak in faith, he really keeps all of those days and all those ceremonial laws and just honor him. I mean, don't argue with him. Don't disregard him. Don't cast him out. Just think, man, praise God. At least, you know, he cares to obey the Lord. He goes, but don't accept him for the purpose of just arguing with him. For, he gives the example, one guy believes he can eat all things. There are no unclean foods like the Old Testament had. But he that's uninformed, he can't eat some of the Old Testament forbidden uh, meats. He can only eat vegetables because if he eats those meats, he thinks he's going to be condemned to go to hell or something bad. Or at least he's disobeying God. I don't know if he believes he'll go to hell. but Now, this isn't a statement about vegetarians. <laughs> that's not the point. Some people go, oh, there he, that's the verse I've been looking for. <laughs> Against that guy trying to, no, he's not anti-vegetarians. It's, it's, it's anti that certain meats are forbidden or you're sinning if you eat them. That's the point. So others will take it and go the other extreme. He goes, verse 3. Let him not despise, let him, let not him who eats those used to be forbidden meats despise the one who won't. Just honor the guy who won't. Say, oh, that's okay. I'm okay with you. Let him not who does not eat those meats, don't let him despise the guy. Harry's eating a big juicy steak or some meat that was forbidden in the Old Testament. The guy goes, how could you do that? Paul says, both of you drop it. That's not what the Lord, the Holy Spirit's saying. That's not what he's emphasizing. Verse 5. One person esteems one day, typically the Sabbath, the Saturday. The other guy esteems another day or every day because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Paul says, be convinced in your own conscience. That's what's important that you don't defile your conscience. And when you look at your brother that doesn't have the more clear New Testament information, honor him. Don't beat up on him is the point. Be gentle. Be patient with him. Don't be boastful like I got the revelation. You don't. Brother, sorry. You just live under condemnation. That's your problem. Don't do that to him. The idea is that let every person be fully convinced in his own mind. Verse 6, he goes, because why? The man who observes one day is more than the other. He does it to honor the Lord. The man who doesn't observe the one day, but every day is holy to him, he does it to honor the Lord. He goes, can't you see the bigger picture? They're doing it to honor the Lord. So verse 10, why are you judging your brother with these different views of, they're not unimportant issues, but they're not the primary issues. They're not the issues we're going to break fellowship with each other over. But that's what's happened all through church history. The issues have shifted, but the same spirit has continued of doubling down and criticizing and arguing. And I mean, in our nation right now, today, 2020, there's about five of those issues that are red hot. And how the believers are talking to each other. And I mean, it's really a, a timely passage to be looking at just about right now. I didn't plan it that way, but it, I mean, Romans 15 has been there the whole time. But it really is. There's issues right in our culture where believers are doubling down against each other. I mean, and even getting hateful and slandering and I'm smarter than you and don't, why can't you get with it? Paul's going, take your foot off the gas pedal. There's a bigger thing. We're in a family of God together forever. Let's get a bigger storyline here. He goes, verse 10, why are you judging your brother? Not just judging, writing him off. He makes it more clear in verse 10. Why do you have contempt for him? These, these differences are breaking relationships. And that's what the prayer of Romans 15 is about. They're demanding the other person see it like they see it. Paul says, don't you know that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and ultimately every person will give an answer for their conscience? So lighten up a little bit. That brother will answer to the Lord. He's obeying his conscience the best he understands. Maybe he doesn't have a fully informed conscience. But let's 
understand the Lord will take care of that. He will, every person will answer to the Lord. So that, even that big picture view just kind of takes a little pressure off of having to make sure everybody sees it your way. Now, we're not talking primary truths, Jesus is the way of salvation, or primary commandments, like the, the uh, different moral commandments uh, in the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the lifestyle commandments, those things. Verse 13, therefore, the takeaway, don't judge one another. Don't write each other off and be critical and have contempt, but rather resolve not to put a stumbling block in front of your brother. Now, here's what it means to be a stumbling block. This is easily misunderstood. The stumbling block, I have liberty to eat the meat that the Old Testament for, had forbidden. You really are troubled by it. So the stumbling block isn't that I eat it in front of you and now you're mad at me. No, that's not it. The stumbling block is I eat it in front of you and for a moment your conscience is emboldened. You go, you know, Mike, he kind of knows the Bible a little bit and I think, okay, good, but I haven't convinced you yet what the Bible says. You're emboldened by my example. So the guy goes, well, you know, maybe it's okay. So he eats the meat that's forbidden in the Old Testament that he's really bought into for all of his life. I go leave and go to the next day. He is so condemned that night. He's going, oh, I am now, oh God, I'm so sorry. I promise I'll never do that again. Paul's saying, hey, Mike, don't embolden him until you fully instructed him and he believes it because you're actually causing him to stumble, meaning to embolden him to do it, and then his conscience is troubled later. Some people misunderstand that and think, if I eat the meat and you don't like it, and I make you stumble, I make you mad at me. No, no, it's the opposite. I make you emboldened to do it, but you're not convinced yet. And your conscience is deeply troubled. That's the point of here. I mean, that's the point Paul's making. Paragraph C, just kind of saying it, just real one, two, three. The issue here of this prayer we're looking at in Romans 15, the two prayers. How do we relate to people in the body of Christ as we observe their wrong views, we observe their failures, we observe their deficiencies. Deficiencies aren't necessarily failures. They're just, we, you know, you don't have the same giftings and capacities other people have. How do I look at you? How do I relate to you when I see you have different views and secondary issues? I see your failures or your deficiencies. Do I, ha, I knew it. Let me tell you, beware of that guy. He has not got his head in the game right. Or do I approach you with a spirit of honor and humility, and I want to be helpful to you, and I want to show honor to you? Now, again, I'm not talking about the primary doctrines of faith, of salvation in Jesus, and believing in him, and the, because the, the, the primary uh, principles of, of conduct that are really clear and emphasized over and over in the scripture. If somebody violates them, we help them to repent of them. And we hold the line with them. Paul's not talking about those issues right here, so don't confuse the issues here. Paragraph D. Let's go back to verse 1. I just wanted you to see verse 1 in the New King James. is a little hard to follow, so I put a couple other translations there just so you could look at it. Paul exhorted them to accept those who were weak in faith. But without seeing it as an occasion to argue with them, to win an argument. Say, you know, brother, I honor you. I let you. But hey, I'm going to show you how much you don't know and how much I do know. Paul says, don't do it to dispute with them. Now, again, weak in faith, I have it defined here. It's not talking about somebody who has weak faith in Jesus. Is he really the Savior? Am I really forgiven? That's not what he's talking about. That's a weak in their instruction, so their conscience is easily troubled by issues that are not primary issues in the Bible, but somebody convinced them of that issue. And so they're unsettled, and they get real condemned when they come up short of that issue. So I have a number of translations there. So you can compare them and see how Paul is. He's talking about avoiding the quarreling and the doubling down and argument and, and the contempt and the disrespectful tone that people have when they're debating these issues. Top of page two. 
another moment or two on this. <coughs> then I'm going to give you a rapid fire list of about 20 issues that are in our culture right now in the body of Christ in discussion. And some of them have more emphasis and some have less emphasis and there's a whole lot of debate on all of these issues. And no, we're not going to stop and go down. I'm going to do it so rapid fire. By the time I do number eight, you're going to forget what number two is. Because this, is ex this excites people. Because they say, okay, what about that? No, that's the exact tone that we're, Paul is saying. I'm praying you out of that tone. <laughs> Just having a little fun here. Okay. Paragraph E. There were rituals and practices in the Old Testament that Moses commanded them because they were pictures of Christ. But when Christ came, the pictures were fulfilled, so those rituals and requirements were no longer, and they, they were no longer required. Paul says it this way, Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast in the liberties, talking to believers who were trying to keep the Old Testament ritual laws and ceremonies because they were fearful God would reject them if they didn't. He goes, stand fast in the liberty. Don't get entangled in those arguments. And I've seen people take this and they uh, apply this to all kinds of moral issues in their life. And they go, oh, I'm set free in Christ. He's not talking about that. He's talking about these laws of Moses that were in the debate in the culture. He says here in, in Colossians 2, you can read it more in depth on your own. He's talking about the same thing. Don't, don't let anybody judge you the, according to the food you eat, what you drink. If you go to the festival, the celebration or not, the new moon, those were Old Testament required days of uh, sacred days, or the Sabbaths, these are shadows of things that were to come. And Jesus came and he's the, the substance. That means he's the fulfillment. He's the glory of what they were just pictures of. So he goes, you don't have to subject yourself to those same regulations. Again, I know people that take this. Paul's talking about the Old Testament rituals and some of the things that were forbidden that are not forbidden now, and they apply them to certain areas of morality and drunkenness and drugs, and they say, I'm set free, and I can be involved in immorality and drunkenness, and the Christ freed me. And Paul says later in Galatians 5, he says, those people are taking advantage of their liberty and using it as an excuse to live in sin. He goes, that's horrible. But that's later on in Genesis 5, but I, I didn't put that verse there. But let's go on to paragraph F. Here's a few examples that people are debating, some sincerely and some with a very wrong spirit. It's breaking relationships. We can hold our convictions without writing the person off and doubling down on them and criticizing them and, and having one-upsmanship kind of spirit towards them. The varying political views, there's 10 of those. I'm not gonna, I just, I'm throwing it out there. Ooh, wearing masks <laughs> in a virus. <laughs> Vaccinations. Are they or aren't they? Does God want us to or not? The use of firearms. In the face of violence, do you or do you not? I mean, there's a lot of folks that take it down a notch. The use of firearms with animals. Do you hunt for food or, yeah, but not for sport, but for food. But can you fish but not hunt? Well, a fish isn't a cow. Besides, you can buy fish sticks at the store so you can skip the whole thing. Civil disobedience. Varying standards on entertainment. There's so many. I mean, I remember in the 70s. I mean, it was really intense in the early 70s. When I got saved in 71. A believer did not go. Many believers would not go to a theater. They would not go to a movie. I haven't heard that in 20 years. Now it's R, R19 or R17 or 13 or GPRX. You know, <laughs> which is which? And one guy goes, oh, if it's got to cut, you know, those letters, no. If it got those letters, yes. Lots of debates. I mean, and the Holy Spirit has his will for people in those things. But they're not, there's nothing in the Bible that says this one versus that one in the detail that some people press it. Varying standards of spiritual disciplines. Foods. 
You know, are they safe, unsafe, healthy, organic, not organic drugs? Well, they're legal, so are they good? Well, I don't know. A lot of legal drugs are bad. Which or which? Well, you're not going to find it in Acts. The use of tobacco. Well, they said if you inhale, that's bad. If you chew, that's not so bad. Like, where's that in the Bible? Inhale or chew? Well, as long as you spit, if you chew, you're good. No, people really make these the main things. Drinking of wine. I mean, it's really hard to prove they did not have wine at the festivals in, in, in the Bible. But wine at a dinner, a family dinner, and wine in a, okay, social context, and then you get a little loose, and then wine after, and then, and then. It's all kinds of debates about that. I mean, really fervent believers are really hunkered down on Two extreme positions and five levels in between. I've heard it over the years. Lifestyle choices. You know, the one thing the Lord has really spoke to me and, and my wife Diane about was having a simple lifestyle. That, that's not a biblical command. It was a personal directive. So I've had lots of friends over 40 years, and they go, do you think it's sinful if we have a big house? I go, I couldn't care less. Matter of fact, do you go out of town and let me have vacation at your house? I'd love it. <laughs> No, I go, I don't care what you do. <laughs> but the Lord spoke to us clearly about a simple lifestyle. I, he there's nothing in the Bible that says you have to do that. He spoke to us. The size and type of car, the types of clothing. Modesty. A lot of groups. Three different versions of what modesty is in clothing. Makeup, jewelry. There's all kinds of, well, that one verse says this, but the other verse says that. And, Domestic issues, homeschooling, right or wrong, child discipline, to use a rod or not use a rod. What, what's the Bible say? Birth control. Well, let's move on quick, okay. Environmental concerns. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to get something off my chest, okay. My wife, she has this thing about these little plastic bottles. She was like, fanatical about saving them all and driving and put them in the right place. And if I just like put them in the wrong trash bin, never mind. <laughs> I love her heart. Anyway, a lot of other issues. Okay. Sometimes when she's not home, I just throw it in that one place, you know. <laughs> She'll come home. She goes, I, what? Don't you care about the environment? Never mind. Paragraph G. I thought. Paul's main point of his instruction all through Romans 14 and his prayer in chapter 15 is that we've got to speak to each other. He's not saying give up your conviction. He's saying steward it in kindness and in honor with patience. Use your insight to win a person's conscience so that they're strengthened, not to win an argument and put them down and talk about them later. That's his point. Paragraph H, he's still in Romans 14. We're going to get to Romans 15 in a minute. <laughs> but then Romans 15 is pretty easy to follow if you know the context of what he's talking about. He says in verse 17, the famous verse, we know the kingdom of God, the primary issues of the kingdom is a lifestyle of righteousness, enjoying our relationship with God, and having peace when there's difficulty and delays and trouble, having a sense of confidence in his leadership, that is what the kingdom of God is. It's not mostly about what foods you eat or what you drink. That's not mostly what it's about. Those are secondary issues. Make the primary ones the primary ones in your relationship with other people. That's what he's talking about. And then again, verse 21, look, look verse 19 says, pursue the things that edify your brother. He says, it's not... It, it is good neither to eat that forbidden meat or not eat it or to drink that wine or not drink it. That's not the big thing. He says what's important, it's better to not do any of that than embolden your brother and then his conscience is strengthened for a minute, but he's not convinced yet. And then he does what you did, he saw you do, then he falls and he's condemned later and you're just happy going down the road. You don't even think about it again. And this guy's really under condemnation. That's what he means by the brother stumbling and he's weak in faith. Roman numeral two. Okay, let's look at the first prayer. He says, may the God, verse five, the God of peace and comfort, 
That's how God is introduced. God can be introduced in many, many ways. The God of mercy, the God of power, the God of wisdom. But the way that Paul is is appealing to the Lord is in line with the prayer that he's praying for the saints at Rome. He goes, may the God of patience and comfort grant you, again, this is the ultimate supernatural work of the Spirit. So don't read this and go, oh, got it. No, this is massive. I mean, I know a lot of folks, we have it a little bit, but consistently in the face of people who oppose us, Walking in patience and, and, and being a vessel of comfort to them. Again, it's easy to do it to the people who like what you like and like you, and they do the same things you do. But in the kingdom of God, there's so many other people in the kingdom of God that don't do it your way. They don't really like what you like, and they might not like you. But we still are a vessel of patience and comfort to them. And you become trophies of the grace of God. And the Lord's going to do this worldwide. He's going to have a a transforming work. John 17 talks about it where the church is going to enter into this family, mature family spirit together before the Lord returns. It's fantastic. But at the same time, there's a betrayal culture operating in the church as well that's criticizing and turning on each other and doubling down on, on, on negativity against each other. Two things happening simultaneous and a lot of folks in between not for sh- fully sure which direction they're going to go with all their heart. He says, may the God of comfort, the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded according to Christ Jesus, that with one mind and one mouth you glorify the Lord, that you receive one another in the same way, the same generosity that Christ received you on the same terms. And do this to be a trophy to the grace of God. I mean, God, when God is so glorified, people see this and go, what manner of woman are you that you, you can respond to people like this? Well, because God treated me this way. And I have revelation of it. So let's talk about the God of patience first. We pray. And so, you know, we pray in the prayer room for the body of Christ in our city or for the body of Christ in other cities. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever group or city we're praying for, this is a fantastic prayer to pray for them or your family or your friends, or your, or your marketplace assignment. We pray for the God, for, uh, for revelation of God's heart of patience. And we pray for revelation of a release of his comfort. When I pray this verse, I've prayed it many times over the years at IHOP for Kansas City. I go, Lord, tens of thousands of believers in Kansas City, I ask that you would reveal your heart of patience. Because when a believer gets touched with God's patience towards them, they become far more patient towards other people. The big problem with people's anger towards one another is the fact they, haven't, they don't have the oil of the enjoyment of feeling God's patience towards them and their weakness. The great need they have is for God to show his patience to them, and then that equips them to be a vessel of patience to others. When God comforts, how does God comfort? Well, God, I'm thinking my personal life, God comforts me, touching me with the Spirit, and my heart just supernaturally giving me peace. That's one, there's a number of elements of comfort, not just one. Another element of comfort, a big one that's kind of rare today, is God gives me the big picture view of my life in the kingdom. And that I'm only in a moment here, but the story, the big picture story, like is so glorious. And every cup of cold water I'm giving moves him, and he remembers it, and his eyes are on me. I get comforted. I mean, we all do. I'm just making this real personal. He can touch me by his spirit, or he can give me a supernatural miracle to comfort me. He can give me insight into the big picture that his eyes are on me. There's a billion-year story of glory. Every detail I do in obedience, even the smallest thing, he remembers it. He's moved by it. He enjoys me now in my weakness. Beloved, that comforts me. I mean, I like the miracle too, you know, whether it's the physical healing or the financial breakthrough or the turnaround of a relationship. He comforts in those miracles as well. But he says, pay attention to God's patience towards you and watch how he comforts you and don't disregard his comfort and get that big picture view of what your life is really about. Because then that makes sense of the trouble you're in, because the trouble's only momentary. It's that 2 Corinthians 4, 17 passage we looked at. Paul says it's temporary light afflictions that are gone in a moment. 
And in its place, we have the eternal weight of glory because we are faithful under pressure. It translates to eternal weight of glory. That's, somebody goes, what's that mean? I, go, I don't know for sure, but that really sounds good, though. <laughs> eternal weight of glory? That's what you get, the exceeding greatness of the eternal weight of glory for small acts of obedience under pressure. Man, that's a good trade-off. I mean, the exchange rate's really high in this age because once you go to the age to come, you don't get that trade-off. We obey under pressure, and it is a huge trade-off in how God views it and, 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 and uh, evaluates our life when we stand before him. And when people see that, it gives them like, oh, you know what? I can do this. Then it gives a couple of miracle breakthroughs, and then the Spirit comes and touches us, a changed mindset. He comforts us in these ways. Well, Paul tells us here in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, he goes, at the end of the day, you only comfort people to the degree you've received it. If that big picture mindset doesn't register with you, you won't be able to impart it to anybody else. If you can't see the miracles that God does in the small ways of your life, all you see is a couple of big things that don't happen your way. Ah, oh, nothing's happening. The Lord says, really? I've done quite a few things. You want me to take them all away and let you see how much I've done? A lot of folks, they've got God working in their life, but they can't see it. So they can't really bring that comfort to other people. So Paul's praying that he goes, if you get a vision, not a vision, more understanding of God's patience, and you can see ways he's comforting you and shifting your mindset and how he's really providing in many ways that you don't even count, you don't pay attention to. I mean, this is true, I'm sure, of 99% of you. None of us know about the car wreck we avoided yesterday because we avoided it. You don't even know what angel was in the way helping you. There are so many things God does we are not even paying attention to. I mean, you can't know those things, but I could put 50 things on that list of way he's, he intervenes in his leadership, and we just think, I'll tell you one of the most remarkable things imaginable Go out at noon and look up. There's this big, broad, bright ball of fire in the sky called the sun every single day on demand. <laughs> that is stunning. So, well, of course. Well, there's one day the lights are going to go out. <laughs> We're going to go, hey, wait, what happened? Well, I think they'll say more than that, but okay, page three. <laughs> there are so many miracles going on in our life. I mean, the other incredible miracle, watch this. this is, watch this. I'm going to think a thought and my index finger is going to go move up. It's amazing. <laughs> no, I got an idea here. Watch this. Doop. Watch it go back down. Have you figured out how remarkable that is? We don't even think about that stuff. God says, I am in your life doing so many more things that you're even aware of. And I'm counting every movement of your heart towards me, and it moves me. And it matters to me. Well, paragraph C, paragraph uh, three, I mean, uh, top of page three. One of the ways he comforts us, oh, I just said all that. In our difficult circumstances, we see there's a big picture storyline. When I see that in my life, it gives me, it gives me energy, not just energy. I have zeal to show it to you when I'm talking to you about your life. When God's patient with me, he's been so patient with me, I think, Lord, remarkably patient, and he, when I stand before him, he says, you didn't get the half of how patient I was with you. But the half I do get, it gives me a lot more energy to be patient with you. And I hear other people and other issues in their life, and I've been given patience by God, and I go, you know what? We serve a good God. Let's, we're on the same team. Let's, let's do this together. Let's figure out a way how to be free and walk with confidence, not figure out a way how to wipe people out and cancel them out. Let's go the other direction, the God of patience. You know, the whole cancel culture. It's one thing that unbelievers do it. That, that kind of makes sense to me. But when believers do it to each other, it's like, do you understand how kind God is to you? Because the Lord has this little caveat. It's more than a caveat. He says, you're going to get mercy to the measure you give mercy. You'll get judgment to the measure you give judgment. There's not in the absolute final sense, but there's a, man, I want, I want to be a mercy guy. I don't want to have a blind eye to important subjects, but I want to find a way to give people confidence to rise up and go forward, not find a way to prove why they're dismissed. I'm trying to find a way to, to give them a hope for tomorrow. And the Lord will say something like, okay, 
Is that how you want to do it? That's how we'll do it. <laughs> Keep it coming, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Paragraph D. Grant to us. That word grant to us like my notes. You could put honor. Put, you could put it in their love. But God grants it. It takes. Here's the part I want to just really get your attention. I think I've made the point over and over. It is a remarkable work of the Spirit when he gives you like-mindedness with someone else. Because here's what like-mindedness is not. Like-mindedness does not mean you agree with everything they say and do. That's not like-mindedness. Like-mindedness means you see their value and honor in God's sight. And they see we value people according to the lens of God's heart and grace. Doesn't mean I agree with the, what the guy said or did. That's not the like-mindedness. But I have agreement on his value that he's worth fighting for. He's worth bearing up with. He's worth standing with. Even if he doesn't like me, he's worth it. He's a human redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That's granted to the human heart to view humans that way. That is not a natural way to look at life. When Paul says, oh, Father, grant this to them, they would have this mutual view of honor towards one another and value. And one of my favorite prayers, I, I pray this all the time. I, I mean, I say it all the time is what I meant to say. I mean, you've heard it over and over, paragraph one under D. We pray, Holy Spirit, let us see how you see. Let us feel what you feel when you look at him. And I, always, I like to say three things. Let me see what you see, feel what you feel, and say what you say about that brother. I want to say what you're saying. I want to say what you're emphasizing about his life. I don't want to say what the devil's saying about him. I want to say what you're saying about him. That's what Paul's talking about. He's praying that the move of a spirit, and when I pray this for Kansas City, I go, Lord, just a mighty historic breakthrough of the Holy Spirit where you reveal yourself as the God of patience. You reveal those four or five ways you comfort the heart. You embolden people to now give this to others. You give them the ability to enjoy you even in the middle of difficult tasks and hard circumstances. They have joy. They enjoy God. They enjoy you, Father, in the labor. They may not enjoy the labor, but they're enjoying you in it. And they got a sense of peace when all kinds of negative things are happening. I say, Lord, release that. Just wash the church of this city with that reality. Pray it for your family. Pray it for your friends. Pray it for ministries that the Lord has highlighted to you. Paragraph 2, well, we know John 17. I'm not going to spend time on that. It's the great miracle, the transformation of the end-time church to mature family, love, and spirit. But it's going to be through these five things of Romans 15 that I've outlined. Seeing the God of patience, seeing the God of comfort, enjoying Jesus, having a sense of peace or security, a sense of well-being in the midst of difficulty, and being anchored in hope having a certainty that what we're doing matters to where we're going. There, those five things embolden the human heart to walk out John 17. And when we walk out John 17, whatever measure, the world looks at these believers and go, the God of Israel must be true, and the God of Israel must truly have sent Jesus because there's no way humans could, could act this way towards one another in a sustained way. It's impossible for humans to do this. That's why the world knows, because this transformed body of Christ, they're trophies of the grace of God. People are looking at them going, the God of Israel, you must have sent Jesus, and your glory's on them. Nobody could do this. They could do it one afternoon or one summer, but they can't do it consistently, and especially not to people who are against them, who don't appreciate them. Again, it's easy to do it if somebody's patting you on the back. This thing is bigger than this. is dynamic. It's glorious. Paragraph three, I've already said it, but I'll say it again. The like-mindedness here doesn't imply everyone agrees on every issue. But we are like-minded in seeing the honor and value through the lens of God's eyes. Because a new believer, if being like-minded meant we agreed with on everything, that means the newest believer has to agree with everything of the most mature believer. And the newest believer says, I've been in the faith three months. Give me a break. I don't even know, I don't even know where that book of the Bible is. I remember when I was six months old in the Lord, and 
They had me as in high school, and I was teaching the junior high group. I go, teaching? I don't even know where anything is in the Bible. They, they talked me into it. And I remember I got up that day, and I said, I want to turn to the book of Palms. It's right after the book of Job. And some guy started laughing. I didn't know what he's laughing at. And he said, it's Psalms. I go, I never even heard the word Psalms before, to be honest, because I didn't grow up in the church at all. And I said, in that job, that's weird, because I was looking for a summer job. I couldn't get any details at all in the book about jobs. It, it made no sense to me. I did, nothing made sense. Well, the point is, I was a little, you know, so a new believer is not going to be like-minded on all the details of faith and every issue. He's talking about mutual honor because we see it through the Lord's eyes. Paragraph E. Pray you with one mind and one mouth. We would glorify the Lord. This is big. And again, I'll leave some of this just so you to read on your own. In our, with one mind, we, again, we see the big picture. We see how God sees them. That's the, a perspective about them. We have this kingdom perspective towards ourselves and one another. That's the one mind. That is not easy and that's not automatic. That is miraculous when we have a kingdom perspective about our own life and towards one another. We see the big picture. We see God's mercy and deficiencies and failures and shortcomings. We see God's glory even when there's delays and, de and setbacks. We see his wisdom. That's the mindset. And we have that mind. When we have that same mind, we can disagree on some of those issues. But it's not enough to have one mind. We need one mouth. We need to say what God says about one another. It's not enough just to see and feel what he says about you. I need to say what he says about you. Oh, I call it the God narrative. The God narrative is those, I'm just making up the number, those 10 headline stories that he wants your life understood by today. God's narrative of your life isn't a biographical resume of everything you've done since you were two years old. That's not the God narrative. It's the headline news he wants you understood by. He wants you to understand it that way, and he wants people to understand you that way. I call it the God narrative. I want to say the God narrative about people. I don't want to find out, well, he's not really that good of a leader. He has this deficiency. You know when he talks to people, he does that. I don't want to point that out. That's, let those other guys point that out. I want the God narrative about you. I want to know, hey, God, did you know that he has that deficiency in his leadership style? Lord says, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what I've called him to. I'm talking about how I see him, telling that stuff. Okay. One mouth. We're glorifying God. Beloved, when we're interested in the God story being told about people and to people, and God the Father's heart is delighting in it, that's the God story, not the other story. The devil's got all the details on the other story. He twists a lot of them, but he's got some other details too. And he wants that to be what fills our mouth towards one another. That ministry over there, they said these bad things about me. And I'll tell you the truth. I know stuff about them. Lord says, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Only tell my story about them. Well, is your story about them that they put me down in a false way? Lord says, no, that's actually not my story about them. My story is they're talking people out of sin. My story is they're trying to obey me. My story, they don't understand you, but that's not my story. That's, I'm changing you in the process. Don't worry about it. You're getting paid well for it. My smile is on you. I'm changing your mindset. I remember, I mean, that's actually real because I've had a few famous guys who have said real negative things about me that were not true at all and they made it on a big, and the Lord says, they're talking people out of sin. They're talking people's marriages into reconciliation. They're, they're laboring in the word. Can't you see that? If we lose that guy, the kingdom loses. Get with my story about him. I'll take care of you. You're good. You're going to be fine. We got to get the one mouth that we tell the God story where we're so that God is honored and pleased as his family is showing value and honor to one another. Number two, a few of you will really appreciate this. He's talking to husbands, and he connects in paragraph two here, second, first Peter 3, he tells husbands, he goes, husbands, if you don't treat your wives right in a godly, honorable way, your prayers are going, they got a ceiling on them. They, they won't be effective. I mean, a guy can beat the prayer reading all day long and be the this and that and the other, but if he talks 
with ungodly speech at home. His prayers aren't fully canceled out, but they are hindered. The way we talk matters. He goes on in verse 10. I don't have it on the notes, but in verse 10, because here it's 1 Peter 3, 7, he goes on to say, I'm talking about speech right now. Well, a couple ladies there going, but they did it so quiet, and I'm just proud of you. That was really good. <laughs> Honey, did you hear that awesome message? <laughs> well, mostly that one point is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just having fun. Okay, he says that like-minded according to Jesus. And I have several ways, I'm not going to break it down, of how it's according to Jesus. Then paragraph H this is so remarkable. I mean, it just can't be overstated. This is the centerpiece of it, although I'm only saying it in one sentence here. I'm going to receive you and the generosity that he receives me? <laughs> really? Well, the problem is, if I don't see the generosity he has towards me, I don't have grace to show it to you. The problem isn't I'm mad at you or you're mad at me. The problem is I don't see how he sees me. When I see the way he sees me, I go, are you kidding? This is how it really is? I can look at you and go, wow, I see the God story in you. Top of page four. I've already said all this. Paragraph B, fill us with joy. The ability to enjoy Jesus. The ability to enjoy his leadership, even when the circumstances are hard. I mean, there's lots of difficult circumstances and I, I share with people here and there, I go, you know, it's really tough what's going on, but at least let's enjoy the Lord today. I don't mean we have to be giddy and happy and jump around, but let's just have that, ah, you love me, I love you. I don't like what's happening at 2 o'clock today, <laughs> but you love me, I love you. I don't like how I feel right now. You love me, I love you. And I enjoy you. I'm so glad you enjoy me. That's where joy is anchored right there. And then we could break that down a little bit more. Peace, that sense of security. Well, how can we have security? The finances and the, this setback and that person's mad and it's not going well and the business is you know, uh, imploding and the ministry is falling apart and my family's mad at me, like, peace? The Lord says, no, get, get a hold of my leadership. I'll get you above the storm to where you can, we can make sense of what I'm doing. You gotta Watch, I'm gonna break in and do stuff. The story's not over yet. You gotta get above the storm. And we get above the storm, the turmoil, that's where peace is. It all comes from divine perspective and the Lord touching us. And then he goes on and he goes, paragraph C, he goes, you get this peace and joy by believing. This, don't miss that phrase. By changing the way you think. And that doesn't happen in one minute. That happens over time. You know, it's just day by day, we realign our mind to the word of God. And then paragraph D, we abound in hope. We get anchored in the certainty. Beloved, we have a 70-year life on the earth. The Bible says some longer, some shorter. We have billions of years in the glory of God, billions. And what we do in this life has consequences and it matters to that life. The smallest acts of obedience, the smallest standing under pressure, resisting a temptation, failing but signing back up and saying, I'm going hard again. I'm going to forget yesterday and believe in the word of God. You love me, I love you. I tell you, that honors the Lord as well. Jump back right into it and have confidence that he is the God of kindness he says he is. Declare war on that area of compromise and have confidence. That confidence actually honors him. But we, we, we're anchored in hope. Hope is a future certainty. Our story is so big and so long, it is worth it. Amen and amen. Well, it's worth it. Come on up, worship team. So I'm gonna pray this over you. Go ahead and stand. May the God of patience, may he reveal his patience to you. All over Kansas City, tens of thousands of believers. Pray this for whatever city you want. Release the revelation of the God of patience. Release it in Cairo in the body of Christ, in Jerusalem. Release it in North Korea amongst the believers, the God of patience. Release the God of comfort, the revelation of comfort. Lord, all over this room, show us the big story. Touch our hearts. Give us some miracles. 
Use others. Give us dreams and visions to show us things. Grant to us comfort so we can be a vessel of comfort to others. Father, do this so the body of Christ would be like-minded. I'm asking for the miracle in Kansas City. The miracle of transformation. All oh, tens of thousands of believers, a thousand different congregations. The transforming miracle that we see each other through the lens of honor and graciousness that he sees us. We're like-minded. That with one mind, with one mouth, we talk about the God story in our own life, in their life. We receive one another in the graciousness He receives us. God of hope would fill us with the ability to enjoy Him when it's difficult on the circumstances. Sense of security that things are going well in His leadership, but we can't see the end of the story. Lord, I ask you to wash our hearts tonight. I ask for this prayer to be prayed over this city over and over again. Over the cities of the earth. The Lord says, this is what I want to release through the church in the end times. This is the John 17 pathway to a mature family life.
We want to tell of who you are. You're wonderful and such a good father. We want to speak of your wonders. Let all my life tell of who you are. All of my life, I want to tell people about who you are. The wonder of your never ending love. The wonder of your graciousness towards us. All my life tell of who you are. What you see, say what you say about others. Wash. 
want to love your people like you love them. We want to see them like you see them. See them like you see them. Love you like they love you. Oh, that you would be glorified. That unbelievers would say the God of Israel, he's the answer. Jesus. The oil of patience. The oil of patience, Lord. Give us grace to give grace. Give us grace to give grace. Spirit, we ask you to come and touch us right now today. Lord, I ask for a prophetic spirit to rest on us, a new measure. Sons and daughters, our siblings, our parents. Dream. 
rest on them when they don't even expect it. Lord, I pray for the prodigals, those family members that have stepped to the right or left. Rescue them. I ask that this would be a week of rescue. Spirit, the gracious rescue. The gracious rescue. 